Hi everyone, welcome to Learning Space. This week uh, we are proud to host team scientists from the uh, Dawn mission that has visited Vesta and is now on its way to Ceres. Um, before we get started, I'd, I'd uh, like to tell you a little bit about what we are and what this is. Um, Learning Space is our weekly hangout where we discuss uh, and by we, I usually mean Nicole Gallucci, who's currently running production in the background, and Georgia Bracey, um, host a variety of people to come in and talk to you about ways that you can learn and help other people learn about planetary science, astronomy, and space science. Um, with me today, uh, I have Paul Schneck, who's, who's having some technical difficulties, so I apologize if he appears to come in and out of the Hangout. Uh, we also have, and I, I should have asked you how to pronounce your last name before I started. I'm so sorry. I have Brett Denevi with us. Uh, we also have our representative uh, from the Dawn Education Public Outreach team, Whitney Cope. Now, one of the reasons that this science is so near and dear to us is at CosmoQuest, we have have the Asteroid Mapper Citizen Science Project that allows you to go in and help scientists, not these two in particular, but help other Dawn mission scientists to map out the dist distribution of larger craters on Vesta, find the boulders, find features that allow us to better understand the geophysics of this little tiny rock that isn't a planet, isn't a moon, it's its own unique thing hanging out kind of midway out from the sun. The types of things that they're going to be talking about today are, okay, someone needs to mute, there's suddenly an echo. Um, so the types of things that we're going to be talking about today are things that you may eventually be able to see in asteroid mappers as we start adding more and more high resolution images. Uh, we also are going to, at the end of the show, introduce you to a whole bunch of different um, asteroid educational tools that you can utilize, so stay tuned for all of that. But for now, I'd like to head straight for the science. But first, one last reminder, you can ask us questions by either tweeting to hashtag learning space, leaving us a comment on the YouTube page, or leaving us a comment on the event page that's hosted uh, by CosmoQuest or by the Dawn Mission. Uh, the best way to make sure that your question gets to us is to leave the comment on YouTube. Um, so, so, Brett, I'd like to start by asking, what, what is is your background and what's the research that that you are most excited about sharing about Vesta? Uh, my background is in geology so my, I have my undergrad degree in geology and um, my PhD in geology and geophysics and it's all frozen now but hopefully you can still see me. You, you look but, just fine here. Okay <laughs> so um, yeah, I um, also uh, studied spectroscopy um, in grad school, so I look at using reflectance spectra to understand the composition of the surface. So, so to break that down a little bit, what, what you're doing is um, different minerals reflect different colors of light in different ways. So by looking at what colors of light are absorbed and reflected by the surface, you can start to understand the composition of different rocks, if I understand this correctly? Yeah, that's exactly it. And then, you know, Don has two instruments that are relevant to that. The framing camera has different color filters that let you get, you know, a good high-resolution picture of the surface in a few different wavelengths. And then there's the spectrometer, which is lower resolution, but lots of different wavelengths and is really good for picking out what minerals are there on the surface. And I, I, I have to admit, I, I'm an astronomer. My universe consists of hydrogen, helium, and everything else is called a metal and given the letter Z. So um, when you start focusing down on individual minerals, what, what are the different things that you're hoping to find? What, what are the things that excite you? Um, what is it that is, is, is special about different rocks? Uh, well, for Vesta, part of what's so exciting is that, you know, you have samples with the HED meteorites of Vesta and then you can have reflectance spectra of those and then tie those back to you know the remotely obtained spectra of Vesta so you can try to get some kind of geologic context for a lot of these samples by picking out you know here's a really olivine rich area here's an olivine rich rock you can start to kind of tie the two together and um, 
it's kind of the reverse of how you know normal planetary exploration usually goes. You have the remote data, and then if you're really lucky, maybe you'll get samples at some point. Um, so, so I have to fess up. My very first time that I, I attended the Lunar and Planetary Sciences Conference, they were giving all of these fabulous talks where everyone was talking about olivine. And other than the fact that it made a cool green jewelry, I had no clue why this rock was important. So, so can you bring other non-rock fluent people up to speed on why olivine is is so much more than just a pretty gemstone? Yeah. Well, I mean. For one thing, I mean, with olivine and with pyroxene, the minerals um, that you can really see on Vesta, um, you know, those are form in, um, you know, volcanic rocks and basalts, and they also occur in different amounts, First, whether okay. you're, um, you know, a volcanic rock that erupts. Oh, we lost her. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so... I, I, I apologize. I, I think that the Hangout um, may have simply gotten verklempt with, with Paul dropping in and out so much. Um, Whitney, could you possibly call Paul on the telephone and, and uh, tell him if he's going to keep dropping in and out to, to maybe not come back in? We're very sorry. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get Brett back. Um, while I, who am not a Vesta scientist, ad lib, um, what I'm going to do is is introduce all of you to the Asteroid Mappers project. So pardon me while I click over to Quest and I will share my screen with you. Um, so so we're trying to get all of you engaged in not just learning science but doing science. And you can see everything that I've been browsing recently and tell that I was watching bad sci-fi earlier. Um, so. With, with CosmoQuest, when you go to our website, you can see that we have these three different science sites set up along the side, and you just click Let's Explore, and, and it takes you straight in to, um, you can read some quick facts or some tutorials, and if you just want to get started doing science, click the Get Started button, and it's going to bring up these amazingly interesting and distorted images, because as near as I can tell, Vesta is the rock that was designed by Dr. Seuss. So what we're asking people to do is to just come in and find the craters, click in their center, and drag out to map where the edges of the crater rims are. And this is slowly but surely getting turned into a map. Now what's kind of awesome is beyond just being able to mark craters, there's also boulders, and I think think this is a, no, the shadows are in the wrong direction to be a boulder. Um, I'm not seeing a boulder on this particular image, but there's boulders you can mark. Um, I'm going to do a bad job so that you can just see more images. My data, all of my data gets thrown out fairly immediately. Um, but as you click around on Vesta, what you find is distorted craters that lie on the sides of ridges. So Vesta really is, um, think that potato that's trying really hard to be a sphere, that's kind of Vesta. Um, let me see if I can pull up a full-sized image. Actually, Nicole, can you drop me a link for a full globe image of Vesta now that we've lost both our scientists. Um, Whitney, do you want to come in and talk about your new curriculum? You need to unmute yourself. Yes, yeah. I just did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me actually send that along to Nicole, that okay. link quickly here. Um, we have, uh, we adore asteroid mappers. We've had um, all kinds of wonderful opportunities to share out the project in everything from STEM tech conferences to um, classrooms and, um, and, and actually have had a lot of fun by just uh, posting uh, an image just like this one up there and having um, participants come up and talk about what craters they see, what they see about the craters and kind of do a, a kind of um, tutorial uh, to um, to engage, you know, and just feel like they can go on it independently. So with that, 
we have developed some um, curriculum pieces that could support that a little bit more, something called Visualizing VESTA and VESTA Mosaic, which helps you kind of tune what I th think of as tuning your eyes to be able to um, be able to you know, kind of differentiate different uh, elements of um, VESTA surface. So let me send this along to um, Nicole here. I'm putting in the chat window there, Nicole. There's the um, the website, and let's see here. So I see that Paul's back on. I'm not sure he's pretty pixelated, huh? I think he's frozen. Okay, so. Um, we have all kinds of wonderful materials. I think one of the things that's been um, a great pleasure to be part of the Education and Public Outreach Group for VESTA, really working to translate this, the, excuse me, for the Dawn mission, translate the, the science of investigating both Dawn and, uh, excuse me, both Ceres and VESTA, is that um, it's a long mission. It's taken us a long time to get out to the main asteroid belt. and. Um, with that, we were able to develop curriculum over time that um, helped, you know, both informal and um, formal uh, education settings kind of access this cool science. And so we have, as you can see, we have some modules that um, have some great literacy components. Um, ion propulsion, of course, is always, you know, very fascinating to all kinds of people. And then, um, and then we have sets of activities that are uh, that are sort of now that we've gotten to our wonderful destinations, what are our next steps going to be? And so the latest two pieces that we have on there are um, the top two. Um, so here you can see sort of the diversity of what we've got. Um, Vesta Mosaic, um, in which you take one of these high resolution images of Vesta and um, each uh, participant gets a square of that and gets to, um, uh, you know, kind of look at their square and uh, uh, create um, a, 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 their own image using um, pencils or chalk and then um, from there if you can scroll down a little bit you can see it a bit better um, from there they're able to you see so they sort of look at how, what an image is this is the original image of Vesta from Hubble Space Telescope and and the pixels there um, either Nicole yeah, and hi. Paul is here, which is fantastic. <laughs> Everyone's back. Yeah. Almost. Yay, yeah. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> Brett, we'll get Brett in a minute. Yeah. And you look terrific, Paul, I have to say, as well. You don't look like pixelated Hubble Vest. No, 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 that's exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. You look like. Uh, and there's Brett. Yay. So, so at so, any rate, we'll, I'll wrap this up. These are just um, some fun activities that are uh, great ways to segue into asteroid mappers um, backing up the great tutorial that CosmoQuest developed to help lead us um, asteroid mappers, I'm one of them, um, to be able to analyze these very cool images from uh, the Dawn mission at Vesta. And I'm going to hush now. Oh, that's, no, this is great. Um, I see, hi everyone, it's Nicole. <laughs> hi. Um, I want to do potato light curves all the way at the bottom. It is, I'll tell you, potato oh light curves is the best. And we've actually done banana light curves and sweet potato. Um, we, we're looking at a lot of diverse shapes, and uh, you really get a, a very neat light curve, and it's a wonderful way, something like albedo is so abstract, but with potato light curves, it suddenly is uh, a kick in the pants, and, uh, you know, we've had, whether it's uh, uh, whoever you are, whether you're a learner who's 15 or 10 or uh, 55, we've had some people have some great times with that. So, right. so we're going to have to do an entire learning space dedicated to light curves of anything we can and discussing yep. light curves of actual asteroids because you can do amazing work. Amateurs are doing amazing work today with backyard telescopes. Um, just measuring how over time and looking at various sites on the planet Earth yep. um, we see asteroids occulting stars and varying in their own brightness of reflected light which brings us back to what Brett was Yay! discussing with reflected light we're so oh, glad that you came yeah, back sorry, I don't know what happens <laughs> it, it's alright connection connections fail but you were telling us the mysteries of olivine and how it, it's formed in basalts 
Yeah, well, it's funny because that's actually not even what I work on for Vesta at all. <laughs> so, um, I mean, yeah, for there's a lot of people on the team who are working on that, and I do that for, like, the moon, and we try for Mercury. But for Vesta, you know, my work all focuses on other things. <laughs> okay, so tell us about what's, what's your work on, on the Dawn mission and studying Vesta. Yeah, so, um, well... Um, Paul and I are both participating scientists on Dawn, and so how that works is you write a proposal to NASA and you're selected to, you know, join the team and help, you know, carry out your selected research. And so what I proposed to do was to look at how the regolith on Vesta varies um, and how it formed and what its depth is, and so uh, the regolith is really just the um, broken up uh, soil and dust and everything that you know covers the whole surface of the asteroid pretty much and um, one of the reasons I was interested in it coming from you know the reflectance spectra and that point of view is because you're not looking at just a, sim a single rock you're looking at you know soil that's been mixed in and churned up and broken up and thrown across the asteroid from you know great distances so you're if you want to look and see, you know, how that material or, you know, where the material originally came from and then how it's been mixed up on the surface as well. Yeah, and so that image that you're seeing is um, one of the few places on Vesta where you might actually be looking at real bedrock. Um, this is in part of the wall of uh, the Rea Silvia Basin. And, you know, it's still probably been fractured and, you know, moved to some degree. But um, you can see, hopefully, in the, um, in the face of the cliff there, there's, you know, a big area of rock that's kind of sticking out and it looks like a little more coherent. Whereas around the sides of it, you have landslides and surficial, um, you know, the, the surficial soil that's, you know, moving around it. And so this is one of the places where um, you see some of the spectral evidence for the um, rock types that are thought to have formed, you know, deeper inside of Vesta. And that's exactly what you would expect in this area where you're looking in a huge impact crater in the wall of it that's exposing some of the interior of Vesta. And... So, you know, this we kind of look for places like this and other smaller areas where you can find some rock that might have actually, you know, formed in it originally right in that spot instead of being mixed up in, um, with all the other rocks. And, and one of the really awesome things about Vesta is because it has been hit hard by so many other objects. There, there are places where impacts have have essentially dug trenches for us to see what are the other soils what are the other mineralogies at different depths within um, so yeah, that absolutely. that's kind of cool so so Paul can you tell us um, and hopefully your connection will stay um, can you tell us about the type of research that you're doing as a participating scientist you're muted yeah I'm muted yeah I basically <laughs> had to reboot and then launch a different browser and it seems oh. to be now, so uh, you try every trick in the book, and hopefully it'll last. But yeah, uh, I'm in the same situation that Brett is in, and I started out uh, not being terribly interested in Vesta, but I became interested in it when I realized that the mission was actually going to go to Ceres after it finished with Vesta. And Ceres is the largest asteroid, but it has, it's interesting because it has a lot of ice. And Vesta comes into it because you have two bodies that are very similar in size uh, where you've got a lot of impact craters probably formed on them. One has got no ice on it at all, or hardly any ice at all, and one has a lot of ice on it, theoretically speaking. So there's a direct comparison we can make. Uh, and, and you're exactly right. Impact craters dig trenches. They're basically uh, free drill, uh, drill probes. On Earth, we use uh, large drilling apparatuses to, to drill 10 or 20 kilometers down into the crust of the Earth. And we can't obviously do that. It's very expensive to take a drilling rig out to the solar system, you know, uh, not, not to mention the, uh, the, the, the life support that would be required. It's just very heavy machinery. So we use impact craters to dig deep and excavate material up onto the surface. 
and that's one of the things we're looking at on Vesta is what are the underground materials? Is there olivine? I didn't hear the earlier conversation, but I did hear you were talking about olivine, and that's one of the things we were looking for is to see is the mantle of Vesta got a lot of olivine on it, like the Earth does. And we're having a lot of trouble finding it, but that could be because the olivine is very hard to detect. Um, but again, uh, I wasn't part of that uh, conversation. But one of the other things that we can look at is the basic morphology of the crater. What is the structure? And that actually is controlled in part by, in large part, by gravity. Now, uh, I had to write down these figures, but they're interesting to, to note that the surface gravity on Vesta is only 2.5% that of Earth. That's a very low gravity field, and if you, know, you want to take out a weight, weight machine and uh, weigh yourself, that would be an interesting place to do it. But uh, it's also 15% of the moon's gravity, and that's, that's where my work comes in, because what I'm doing is comparing morphologies on the of impact craters on the, on the moon versus those what we're seeing on Vesta. We're actually able to look and see how does uh, the impact process itself differ depending on what the gravity of the body is that you're looking at. And, uh, and this is basically a matter of if something has more gravity um, the the way the crater is going to evolve over time is is going to differ in terms of what sort of slumping ha happens on the edge. So if if you've ever dug a hole on the beach, you you may have experienced if you dig the hole deep enough, bad things happen to the hole. And craters that, are that's exactly right. And uh, it's not only a uh, long term deformation, but it's also controls how the crater forms in the first few minutes. And uh, can we? Can you show a slide for me? The um, uh, Vesta Moon Crater slide. Uh, I like, uh, can we show that slide? Yes. I like to show this slide because I don't label it, which is Vesta and which is the, on the moon. There's two craters shown here. They're both about 20 kilometers across, which is, I can never do the calculations about, uh, uh, about 10, uh, no, uh, yeah, about 10 miles across, something like that. One is from, on one side is uh, uh, a crater on the moon, the other side is a crater on Vesta, and I asked my colleagues to guess which is which. And there's actually not a lot of difference between the two. If you look on the sides of the impact crater, uh, you see these um, narrow little uh, deposits on the flanks. Uh, you can also see, see some of the regular uh, outcrops that, that Brett talked about on the left-hand side. We also see these long, narrow things coming off the sides, and those are actually small-scale debris slides. It's the kind of deformation that, that happens when you form a large crater. It's a big, deep hole. The, the slopes of the crater are 30 to 40 degrees. That's kind of unstable, so it wants to collapse, and gravity forces that. Uh, and as it turns out, the one on the left is the Vestan crater, and the one on the right is the lunar crater. And the big difference between the two is that, and these are both the same size, same scale images, the lunar crater has a lot more debris on the bottom. And if you look at the right-hand image there, you see that there's this rolling kind of hill, hill deposit on the bottom of it. That's actually a deposit of impact melt with uh, broken up impact debris. Now, uh, Brett talked about regolith being formed of broken up uh, uh, rocks due to impact. The dog's interested. No? Okay, that's good. And, and what happens is that uh, the impact generates a lot of heat and breaks up a lot of uh, rock because it's uh, of high velocity. This, this asteroid hit at five kilometers per second, probably. So it's melting a lot of rock, breaking up a lot of rock. And the moon, the impact velocity is even higher. It's more like 15 kilometers, almost 20, uh, more like 20 kilometers per second. And that high velocity means that the moon creates a lot more melt and a lot more impact debris. And that's what we're seeing in the bottom of the lunar crater. But otherwise, the two craters are pretty darn similar, which is, which is actually quite reassuring that, that, that the impact process is working pretty similar on both bodies. Um, 
So I don't know. Anybody want to talk about anything else, or I can uh, show a few more slides? Do you want to go back to to Brett now, or? Uh, well, I I think one of the interesting things that you've introduced here is, um, with with the impact process, you're you're dredging down, you're revealing different things, and and your interest in getting tied into this uh, was brought in in part with Ceres and the fact that we do have these two asteroids, one of which is on the icy side of the asteroid belt, and one which is on the baked dry side of the asteroid belt. And if you could explain how this ended up happening, and and what this means, and maybe bridge into to, to, I'll give you a sneak preview of volatiles which are coming in the future. That would be awesome. You mean how Vesta ended up with no ice and Ceres ended up yeah. with no um, ice? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. Uh, it, uh, it gets back to the formation of the solar system itself and the fact that the sun is warm. And uh, as the planets began to accrete from small... Uh, particles, you can think of the rings of Saturn as kind of almost analogous to that in some ways. Small or rocky pieces and icy pieces of different sizes, they begin to slowly accumulate and grow into larger and larger planets. But there's a zone where water ice uh, is not stable and tends to remain a vapor and doesn't accrete very much and is actually driven off by the solar wind. And I'm kind of mixing a lot of these concepts together, but, but the general uh, uh, principle, and, and hopefully Brett can correct me on some of this, uh, is that there, that that transition where water ice becomes a stable mineral and can form clumps and, and solid particles is somewhere in the middle of the asteroid belt. Uh, and uh, Jupiter has a lot of icy satellites, whereas Mars and, the, and the Earth have rocky satellites. Uh, and Venus and Mercury have none, but still, they're, they're dumbly rocky bodies. So even though the ocean is four kilometers thick on, on the Earth, that's not very much uh, when you think of the mass of the Earth. Uh, so Vesta and Ceres are, are on either, just very close on either side of that transition zone line uh, where ice is unstable and ice is it becomes stable again. Now, we don't really know for sure how much water ice is really in series, but we think there's quite a bit. It may be up 30 to 40 percent. And, and what's been kind of awesome is, is there's been surprising evidence that, so, so in, in science we like to use fancy words for, for things that aren't that fancy. So we use the word volatile for anything that will basically turn to gas if you get it hot enough. So water is volatile, um, carbon dioxide gas, dry ice basically, um, is, is, is a volatile. So all of these different things that, that we use to cool drinks at the bar <laughs> on Friday night, those are volatiles. Um, yeah, yeah, no. oh, I was about to ask Brett a question and she's yeah. still... Well, she's yeah. having the same problem I have where the lights go out automatically. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, sorry, they're like on a motion <laughs> sensor which is yeah. behind something that can't be so. We, we have that problem at work all the time. You're working really hard and diligently, and the lights turn off on you. Um, so, so they're finding evidence that that even though Vesta's on the bake dry side of that line, that there still were volatiles. So, can can you explain a little bit about that, Brett? Yeah. So, you know, like Paul said, Vesta wasn't expected to have a lot of you know volatiles that were native um, to the body, and you know what volatiles it did have probably when you had these volcanic eruptions you know into a vacuum with no atmosphere you were you know you probably lost a lot of you know water and the gases that were erupted along with uh, the magmas so um, one of the interesting things um, that we saw came um, in a couple forms actually it was kind of a neat thing where each instrument on Vesta contributed something to the picture where um, we had from the gamma ray neutron detector evidence for hydrogen on the surface and so they can measure you know elemental abundances and hydrogen was starting you know they started to find it and not you know in permanently shadowed craters at the poles you know like has been found on mercury or in the moon but right, you know, in broad areas across the equator. And um, when you look at where those occur, 
Sure. Um, they were related to dark areas on the surface of Vesta. And then um, the uh, spectrometer could also see evidence for hydroxyl in the reflectance spectra in those areas. And then when we looked with the Okay, big, wor big word again. Um, hydroxyl? Sorry, um, yeah, so you can see absorptions in the reflectance spectra that can either be due to uh, water or to OH. And you can't always tell those apart. So to be conservative, we say just the OH part, the hydroxyl. Which um, is a fancy way of saying things like alcohols, which is far more cool to think about. Yeah, and it's so um, all of this, you know, hydroxyl or water is completely implausible to be in the form of, you know, like water ice or some kind of thing that's just sitting on the surface because Vesta gets, you know, plenty warm and there's no atmosphere, so it's not going to be stable near the surface or on the surface. So there's not, you know, big piles of ice or anything, but what you do have is um, water or these um, hydroxyls that can be bound within the minerals. And um, that was actually seen in some of the uh, Vesta meteorites, where it's not coming from um, the Vesta part. It's from little clasps of exogenic material, things that are land on the surface come from, you know, other meteorite impacts get mixed in with the soil. And so um, what we think when you put all the different evidence together, um, is that you have carbonaceous materials that are, um, you know, from the results of impacts. And when you have those kinds of impacts, you know, usually on like the moon or Mercury or somewhere like Paul was talking about, those happen at really high speeds. And so you totally vaporize most of the projectile. And those volatiles, like you said, are lost. But on Vesta, the impact speeds can be a lot lower in the asteroid belt. Things aren't hitting quite as hard as Paul mentioned. So you can kind of preserve some of this um, foreign material that has its own water um, and keep that on the surface. So, so and, this is really a, an awesome story that, that I want to pull apart a little bit. Yeah. So basically what, what's happening is, is you had happy little Vesta orbiting in the asteroid belt. And and it's not Han Solo's asteroid belt. If you're standing on Vesta, you're not really going to see another asteroid. But now and then things do get close to one another. And at different points in our solar system's history, something rich with with waters, with, with alcohols, these hydroxyls, um, other forms of volatiles, so think comets, um, have come along and they've had the types of orbits that allowed them to have a slow motion collision. So it wasn't anything too traumatic. The volatiles survived the impact. But then something more violent happened along the lines, causing chunks of Vesta to get thrown into space where they started this amazing journey where chunk of Vesta that's carrying part of that comet that came along, that exogenic volatile that got embedded in the rock, so something hits Vesta, throws up rocks, those rocks end up on wild orbits that eventually end up carrying them all the way back to Earth where scientists like you guys, um, hello? We my can video. see you, we can hear <laughs> okay. you. Okay, my video temporarily went away. So this is scientists like you can, can go down to uh, Antarctica, collect rocks, look at the spectra of the rocks and realize, hey, this thing reflects light the same way Vesta reflects light. We have a chunk of Vesta. So that's just an amazing set of multiple collisions that took part to get that sample to your laboratory. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then what's kind of neat is that we can see um, in some of these craters that happened you know, after, it's not just comets, but, you know, pieces of other asteroids that, you know, like Paul was saying, may have formed farther out, had more water in them, and, you know, got mixed into the regolith on Vesta. Then later impacts came in at, you know, sometimes higher velocities, and basically all that water, the heat from the impact, heated up so high that it's not stable anymore. And it starts to, you know, um, degas into space. And so I had um, some of the pictures of some of the pitted terrain. Um, 
yeah, I should show this, but um, yeah, this is a perfect one. So the crater, um, the kind of context image on the left is of um, the crater on the bottom is the crater Marcia, one of the you know biggest young fresh craters on Vesta. And on the right hand side, you can see the floor of the crater. And um, hopefully you can see this kind of unusual texture yeah, so on the floor. Five kilometers across, by the way. Yeah, yeah. The well, it went away, but the scene on the um, on the right is, uh, yeah, about 15 kilometers across, I think. Can you guys still see it? I see it as like a teeny little box, but. Um, yeah, you have to click on it to see it big. Pamela does it for the audience. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so, yeah. There we go. Um, so you can see all these little pits that are on the floor of the crater. And we think that these um, formed when you had this water basically degassing from the hot um, material. Um, after this impact crater formed. And as the water kind of degassed, it left behind these little, you know, pits that have actually also, um, they're, you know, we haven't seen anything like them on the moon or other asteroids that we've seen at high resolution, but we have seen some of them on Mars. And um, we have another picture that hopefully shows that comparison. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, so, you can see hopefully how similar these look to the Mars examples um, on the um, the left two images are um, images of the floor of craters on Mars and then on the right hand side is Vesta and so these kinds of pits have been described as almost like soap bubble kinds of geometry where you had these volatiles kind of bubbling up in the um, forming these pits where they started to kind of coalesce and um, grow. And then once it's done degassing, you're left with these really unusual shapes, which were you know, clearly pretty unexpected for Vesta, where we thought it would be just dry. I take, oh, now we're back on air. Okay. <laughs> oh. You're muted, Pamela. Sorry about that, folks. I just, we're back on air. <laughs> I, I unscreen saved and it decided to eat my transmission. Um, today is the day for chaos. And, and um, okay, yeah. so we're back. You've now seen pitted terrains. Um, now, we, we have pitted terrains we're learning. We have uh, interesting minerals, including the ever-mentioned olivine, which still makes great jewelry, even if you do find it on other planets and rocks. Um, what, what other sorts of, of awesome terrains are the two of, two of you finding? Paul, what's, what's your favorite thing that, that's been found on Vesta that wasn't anticipated beyond just um, all the images of it are just so much smoother than what we see for the Moon and Mercury for similar sized features? Well, a couple things. One is the, the large impact basin at the South Pole, which has got a very unusual and complicated geology, and we can talk about that uh, at some other point. But uh, one of the other uh, surprises, I guess, was uh, these odd-shaped craters, which I like to probably call bipolar uh, craters. Uh, and if you could bring that slide up, uh, we can talk about those. Is, is this the uh, Rutney? Uh, Antonia. Antonia, okay. Antonia. And what I mean by bipolar is uh, really the bimodal or asymmetric craters is that they really have, seem to have a split personality. And, and, and normally in a crater, uh, usually it's pretty symmetric. You know, you've got a rim around, a circular rim and a central peak and you've got terraces and, and whatever else. It's pretty symmetric more or less. And this slide here uh, shows a couple things. Uh, let me bring it up. One, it highlights 
the amazing data sets that we've acquired, uh, and I'll go through them for you so you understand what they are uh, as we go from left to right. Uh, the, the, left, the first image is the base mosaic, which is basically the global coverage uh, in the single filter that we have uh, in the clear channel uh, at about 20 meters from about 75% of the surface uh, and seven, uh, 70 meters for the entire surface. And then we also have high resolution uh, color imaging. I think that was in I want to say seven or eight filters. Do you remember what that was, Brett? I can't remember exactly what it was. Uh, but we also have infrared uh, spectral measurements out to about five microns, I believe, as well. Uh, so that frame illustrates that we got some good high resolution color. A third frame is topography, which is at about uh, at least 70 meters resolution or better. So we got high resolution topography. It's color coded so the blue is low and red is high in this particular case. So you can see it's sloping off pretty steeply to the bottom of the frame, uh, which is, is an important clue to what's going on. And from the topography, you can also get the, the slope, how steep the surface is at each individual point on, on the surface. We also have the elemental abundances that we talked about earlier as well, but uh, that's a very low resolution. It would have basically one pixel in this scene. And this is Antonia Crater, about 17 kilometers across, and there's, which is right in the center of the scene, and there's some other craters around it as well. This is actually on the floor of the giant impact basin, so it's pretty large basins, about 500 kilometers across. You hardly, you hardly see any of it here. And uh, let's see, can we zoom in on the first uh, panel? Is that possible? Yeah. Or the third panel, actually. Or, uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. You see how asymmetric this is. And what I mean by that is that the uh, bottom half of the crater, I'm sorry, the top half of the crater, which is to the north, on the steep slope, has got a classic uh, shape to it. Basically a steep scarp. It's got these debris uh, slides, small little bitty debris slides coming off the rim, all going down towards the center. It's all very... They're all very normal and happy. But on the bottom uh, half, it doesn't have that at all. It's got this rubble only strewn slope. It's rounded. Uh, it looks like it's two different craters that formed at the same time, but it's in fact one, one large crater. Uh, and we didn't actually recognize this landform very, uh, very much until recently. Uh, we're starting to see some of it in the lunar orbiter data that's been coming down. There's a, a handful of lunar craters that look like this, but Vesta has a high proportion of these craters. There's like uh, like a hundred of them scattered around. It turns out that they're actually uh, formed on, you see them on steep slopes, steep regional slopes, and there's a couple things we think that's going on. Uh, one is that when you hit the, the, the side of a, a, a slope at, at an angle, I, can't really, I guess I can't show it in, in it, it hits like this, and it, splay, it blasts material up. And some, uh, because of the fast rotation of Vesta, about five hours, and also the steep slope, that material actually falls back down on that side and is not symmetric. The other uh, odd fact is that uh, all of the, the areas um, that have these the steep scarps, the failed scarps, are on the high standing side. That means that that is the part of the crater that has failed. Uh, it indicates that that part has uh, its strength has been exceeded, and you get the standard slumping that you get the, the rim slumps. Um, it's kind of a complicated. Uh, mess between these two different processes, the asymmetric fallback of the ejecta and the fact that you've got a, one, one uh, side of the crater is uh, uh, one, one side steep like this and the other side shallow like this. So this part fails, the material comes off the rim, and the other part doesn't. Uh, so you get these odd shapes. If you, let's see if we can scan over to the second panel, you can see the color. I don't know if that was possible to explain that on the, <laughs> on the web, but uh, I made a stab at it. You also see these odd um, 
colors, uh, especially on the uh, south uh, west side. You have this dark material coming off the side that's been ejected out onto the surrounding terrain. You also get some yellowish materials. I, I'm not sure, Brett. Is this some of that dark um, carbonation, carbonaceous material? Do you think this is an example of that? Yeah, I don't know. It could be, but you know, some of the dark material people have thought is, you know, impact melt or you know, buried pyroclastic. So I, I'm not sure about this example. Yeah. And I, I'd like to to cut in. This this is not true color, Vesta. If you get close enough, does not come become funky fluorescent green. Uh, this is a whole variety of different, very narrow band filters that people have faked the color on. Yes, it goes out just into the near infrared, just beyond. So it's not uh, fake color; it's enhanced. <laughs> it's uh, Superman vision, I guess you want to, because he can see out into the infrared and the ultraviolet. So we're basically just pushing the edges of human vision out, uh, not too far in this case. Uh, we're not in, not out in the five micron band at all. We're here. We're about one micron, and usually the human vi human vision goes out to about 0.6 or 0.7. So we're at about one micron, I think, in the, in the 0.95, something like that. Uh, so it enhances the the color differences. The color differences are real, though, um, and the color has been stretched a little bit to make it look wonky. But it, it's a nice picture because it shows uh, uh, and, and the green stuff. Uh, we should make a note is not olivine, uh, but might have a little bit of more olivine in it than normal. It's actually characteristic of something called diagenite, uh, and diagenite is um, uh, correct me, Brett, but I believe it's the um, mixtures of the other. It's a regolithic mixture of the other uh, meteoritic types. Is that right? That, that we got from Vesta. Howardite is the mix. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Uh, so um, diagenite is is believed to be the deeper rooted uh, uh, rock type uh, of the three Vesta meteorite classes that we have. The other is Eucritic. Um, they're all bas bas basaltic in, in general composition, but uh, the diagenite has larger grain sizes, I believe. Um, uh, and this is again on the floor of the Reyes Silvia Basin, which is 500 kilometers across. It's supposed to excavate the mantle. Uh, so, so, yeah. so the Reyes Silvia crater is that awesome crater on the south end of Vesta, where Vesta right. basically looks like it got it, its 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 derriere smushed in by, by an incoming impact. Which then right. rip is that the one that causes the ripples further out? Yeah. It's grooviness. Yes, <laughs> the source of its grooves. It, uh, it, it, it had a couple effects. It blasted a couple kilometers worth of ejecta out onto the surface all around the equator. And it appears to have formed large scale fractures that, that basically ring the equator uh, of Vesta as well. And also may have created a whole series of small scale fractures. <laughs> but it, it had a pretty dramatic effect. But it also definitely excavated deeper material than we would normally have seen on the surface, and it is actually uh, it, it is actually the dominant event that produced or actually sent those meteorites to us. It's the only imp well, there's well, there's two impacts that could have done it, but but this is the most recent one that could have actually launched all those meteorites off of Vesta into the asteroid belt where they got circulated around, and some of them came to Earth. And there's probably a whole, there's thousands of tons of those meteorites still out there in the asteroid belt, and eventually they'll find their way to other planets. So I want to remind you guys, if you uh, have a question or comment um, before we start wrapping up, you can use the YouTube channel. I'm uh, watching you guys there. Uh, and the event page as well. If you're using Twitter, use the hashtag learning space. That'll show up in our comment tracker as well. Um, and I've posted a couple links in the event page comments, which I will also include in the YouTube video description uh, when it's all done.
I don't know if Pamela's trying to talk, but she's muted. No, no, I, okay. was, I was waiting to see if someone jumped in. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I'm going to, to take advantage of this moment to pull up a picture of Olivine, because really, we ah. keep mentioning it. It's worth seeing what it is. Um, and if the two of you could, could get one interesting piece of science about Vesta out that justifies why the Dawn mission is on its way out there, what piece of science would you want everybody out there to know? And while you think about answering that, Nicole, could you tell people what the, the next Hangouts coming out? Oh, sure. Uh, so the next Hangouts we have coming up today is Wednesday. I do this every week. I go, what day is it? Tomorrow, um, I don't know if there's a Planetary Society hangout uh, scheduled, but those are usually on Thursdays at noon Pacific. Uh, Friday at noon Pacific, we will have the weekly space hangout. All your favorite space journalists will be going over the news from the week. I don't know what we're going to be talking about yet, because uh, we've got a few stories uh, in the queue, but, you know, whatever else happens in the next couple days. Uh, and then Sunday night, we have the virtual star party with um, our amateur astronomers from around the globe showing their telescope views. Uh, while we look at a pretty picture of Olivine. And Monday is Astronomy Cast, episode 301. You guys hit the 300 mark last week, so yay! It was kind of awesome. I can't believe how long we've been doing this. But this this is Olivine. This is the thing that I think planetary scientists talk about more than any other specific mineral, which as an astronomer I find highly amusing. I don't know why I can't explain it. Um, it's because it's this, it's near, it's, it has nothing to do with water. Well, it's the most abundant mineral on Earth, so okay. by it's far the most abundant mineral on Earth. Except we can't get to it very easily. It's mm. you know fifty kilometers down. So, uh, yeah. so that means that if we like uncovered fifty fifty meters, you said kilometers. Kilometers. 50 kilometers, that's a bit harder. A little so bit further. If we removed the top fifty kilometers of the Earth, the Earth would look like this pretty rock. Oh, a giant gemstone, I guess, if you want to put it that way. These, these are just interesting things to think about. I know lots of science fiction writers, some of whom are watching this, waving at PG, who we know is out there. Yeah, um, but like, yeah. just because you, you mentioned it, I mean, the olivine is so interesting, like, because you have places that are huge craters that, that you know, on the moon are, for example, ripped off. 50 kilometers mm -hmm. of the crust and you can see some of this olivine in the mantle so you want to know what the inside of the moon or Vesta or you know any planet is made out of and this is kind of giving when you see that abundant olivine you know you're kind of getting a look into the the mantle so so this this has been a great whirlwind conversation about many different varied things with Vesta if you out there in the audience would like to do your own Vesta investigations. Check out Asteroid Mappers. Go to CosmoQuest.org. Click on the Vesta Mappers link on the landing page or under Do Science from anywhere on the website. We are getting ready this evening to send out a newsletter to everyone who's involved. We're going to do a one-time spam of the entire community to make sure that people know that this exists. If you don't have an account on CosmoQuest, you won't get our newsletter. So go set up an account if you haven't yet. Um, We'd like to remind everyone that if you want to learn more beyond just exploring Vesta using asteroid mappers, there is a, a whole series of educational materials that the Dawn folks have put together that are on their web website and are also available through NASA Wavelength. And we are getting ready to develop our own educational materials highlighting asteroid mappers. Uh, so if you'd like to investigate Vesta, uh, I think we're actually saying investigate. Yes, I think we have submitted an abstract for next year's National Science Teachers Association conference with that title, so we're locked in. <laughs> okay, so so we're going to be developing materials, and if you are a school teacher or an outreach person, or just like to communicate science to others, and you have ideas, let us know. We will always give you credit, and we're happy to run with great ideas. So it's well, a great. Ha Go ahead. Yes, we say. I, I mean, it's uh, we want to partner with you, and we love anybody's great ideas too. Yes. For things that you think would help, you know, just illustrate, help us translate this fantastic science that uh, Brett and Paul have been sharing. Um, we're we're behind you too. So collaboration That's is brilliant. That, that's awesome. So I'd like to give our parting words to our two scientists. Um, so so what? things would the two of you like everyone to know? Paula, go ahead and start with you. 
Uh, I would say that uh, the thing that comes out of this, to me at least, is Vesta as a whole body. And this is the first time we've actually looked at a large uh, planetary body in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter in that transition zone between the, the dry, rocky part and where you begin to get stable water ice. And Ceres is an important component of that. I mean, we've looked at smaller asteroids before. Uh, the largest one, I think, has been about 50 kilometers across, I think. Uh, and they've been chunks, basically things broken off from other objects or things that never really got very far. But this is the first time we've really looked at a, uh, at a what we call a protoplanet, a planet, a planet that basically just barely began to get formed. And we were really surprised by the the uh, com geologic complexity, the, these troughs, the, these large impact craters, the, the deposition all across the equator, the amazing color comp uh, differences that we've seen. Orange craters, or in, in red craters, and green craters, and values um, you know, here. But it really surprised us, I think, and pleased us. We were very, very pleased that we had something interesting to study, uh, not just a boring old rock. Uh, with a lot of geologic complexity, we're actually seeing uh, for the first time what went on in this transition zone in the asteroid belt. And Ceres, in a little less than two years, is going to be the next key to unraveling that. I mean, the solar system is just a big, giant uh, jigsaw puzzle, and this is an important piece of it. Um, yes, well, so for me, I guess what I really like about um, not just this mission, but you know, all the other missions to asteroids and everything is that each one is really um, gives you a feel for how unique and how much you know diversity there is in the solar system. We visited a few asteroids with spacecraft: Eros, Itokawa, Vesta, um, and each one has had you know really surprising, distinct features. You know, ponds on Eros, this weird pitted terrain. Each one is its kind of own um, interesting geologic body and so it's really exciting to think about you know what will um, you know the OSIRIS-REx target asteroid I forget it just got named I forget what it's called now but um, you know what will what will we find there and all the exploration that leads to these really um, distinct worlds that you can go from you know Vesta being a tiny um, you know pinprick of light in the sky to, you know, kind of a fuzzy blob from Hubble to this very detailed picture where we're starting to look at such um, interesting and complex geologic processes and evolution that can tell us about what happened and what's going on in the early solar system. Um, and that's one of those things that even though you're just kind of focusing on your little science question every day, it's the you know, the awe and the wonder um, that, you know, made you get into this field in the first place. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, you guys, uh, Brett and Paul and Whitney. And uh, Pamela's currently muted because there are dogs barking in the background. So <laughs> thank you, uh, everyone, again, for joining us uh, and sharing the Vesta science with us and helping us do the science on CosmoQuest. And uh, we'll see you next week. Great. <laughs>